but it's like a ragtime, you know, dance number. Basically. <laughs> 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 it's very happy. They were super excited. Right. Like, hey, you're dying from radiation poisoning, but like, right. enjoy this jazzy dance. Like, number. this song needs to be about tacos, <laughs> not <laughs> not radio. <laughs> I'm Paige. And I'm Megan. And this is Spooky Science Sisters. Hey there, I'm Sydney. I'm Jess, and we're the hosts of Malpractice Podcast. Our show is about medical true crime, the history of healthcare, and dope modern science. Super dope. <laughs> Join us every Wednesday to hear us cover all kinds of topics, from Theranos and the story of Elizabeth Holmes, to the DuPont chemical scandal, to the history of lobotomies. If you love humor, science, true crime, twists and turns, and captivating interviews of really, really smart and inspiring people, Malpractice Podcast might just be the show for you. And we could be your new best friends. (laughs) If you like what you're hearing, you can check out our show wherever you listen to podcasts or find us on YouTube for copies of our episodes. And don't forget, Malpractice Malpractice Makes makes Perfect. perfect. (laughs) Hello, you're listening to Spooky Science Sisters, a podcast where we present to you a science-based and probably very giggly although as of late, very depressing discussion on all (laughs) things strange and unusual. So originally we had planned to make this an episode discussing all kinds of lab and plant disasters, but we ended up getting a little too excited with our notes about radium girls. So we've decided that they deserved an entire episode. Uh, And Megan got to geek out about volcanoes in our last episode. So now it is my turn to get way too excited about lab disasters and workplace safety. Because that's a perfectly normal thing that people get excited about. Yes. (laughs) And I'm very proud of this. But since we are talking about radium, you might say that it's your time to shine, Paige. (laughs) I know that Blake from Monster Talk would be proud of me. (laughs) That one's for you. (laughs) That one's for you, Blake, if you're out there. (laughs) Okay, well, we should do something spooky, which uh, bodes well that there's nothing noted here for you, Paige. (laughs) I feel like I already know, but has anything spooky happened to you in the last couple of weeks? Wait, has something spooky happened to me? Yeah. Oh, what happened? That's what I asked you. No, no, I'm saying like, oh, I, I know thought you, because you said you, I already know. So I thought you were like saying that there was something that happened to me that I forgot to write down. No, and I was like, I meant like, I already know because there's nothing written down. So I, I got it. Like probably <laughs> there's nothing. <laughs> or I'm just being really creepy. I already know what happened to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's my something spooky right there. Uh, uh, but yeah, nothing else that I could. I, I feel like something happened and I thought like, oh, I'll talk about that. But it's. It didn't get here, so it couldn't yeah, have been too important. I feel like I think about it like a couple times every time we're in between recordings, and then I don't write it down, and then it's not in my head at all by the time. Right, we're ready to right. Go. So I really need to start like keeping a little note on my phone for things that happen that I'm like, oh, that's kind of weird. Yeah, right all now, the my something spookies. Yeah, right now my toddler is freaking me out because she's running around her room like a little ghost. And she should be sleeping. <laughs> Sleep is for the week. All I see on the baby monitor is just like her little light colored pajamas. Like go one way across the room and then the other way across the room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Lord. Other, well, I was going to say, other than toddler running around the room, is there anything else spooky that's happened to you? So I have two things, which are... Not really spooky, but one is toddler related still. But my something spooky is that like in the last couple of weeks, we potty trained my toddler, <laughs> which I think is scary. <laughs> 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 or maybe I was more scared leading up to it than I am now. But you know, it it went okay. It went it went pretty well. We're we're happy. But oof, toddlers are a lot sometimes. My second thing is 
an update on the Winchester mansion specifically that I'm like pretty sure that we're going to get banned before we even get a chance to visit. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> it's been so I, long. Because I have now made two sassy videos about <laughs> it on TikTok. God damn it, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> and first, the Winchester, like the Winchester mansion has a TikTok account. And the first video that I made, they commented and were like, no, we don't tell our tour guides to say that the ghost caused the earthquake. And I was like, oh, okay, whatever. But <laughs> <laughs> I think I said something nice. I was like, oh, that's good. Like, glad you guys are changing yeah, your ways. Cause like, I heard that this was a thing. They're going to listen like, to this episode and now they're going to know what you really thought. <laughs> Oh, whatever. <laughs> um, okay. So then I posted one the other day, yesterday, just yesterday about <laughs> like, just like giving them a hard time for, you know, Sarah being this really interesting person and very smart and capable and how like all this stuff about her is is bullshit and you know they're perpetuating it at the house and like someone tagged the winchester oh, no. <laughs> house account and they have not responded <laughs> i just like responded to the comment and i was like if you guys get me banned before i even get to go fist <laughs> 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 but it's like um yeah so someone did comment that they like they went on a tour and like just this week and said, oh, like they, you know, they did talk to us about how smart she was and capable and how she was interested in architecture and stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, but if you go to their TikTok account, like they have stuff about ghosts on there. They have stuff about the seance room. They have like things that allude to like her being sort of a nutcase, like with like the different rooms that she was having designed and stuff like that. So it's like, but they don't regardless put of if they like have a historian on staff and like they you know try to do some things right they are still very much perpetuating like a lot of the negative right uh perceptions so anyway so i have beef with the <laughs> <laughs> gonna get into a virtual fight we'll just wear disguises when we go they won't even know it's you it's fine <laughs> we're getting in <laughs> <laughs> I would probably wear it as like a, a badge of honor if my face got posted up there. Like, don't <laughs> let this woman in here. <laughs> uh, yeah, but how cool would it be to get in and get a picture with your picture? <laughs> That's true. So really what you're telling me is I need to push more buttons. <laughs> push more buttons and then we'll find you a really good disguise. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so we can talk about Radium Girls, which I'm super excited about because I worked with radioactive stuff in grad school. So yay <laughs> for yay. modern safety measures. <laughs> We're going to talk about why I'm not <laughs> radioactive now. <laughs> So at the start of World War I, um, there were a bunch of factories being established to produce radium painted dials and watches. And the paint that was used for the dials was a mixture of radium, zinc sulfide, and then an adhesive. And radium paint glows in the dark, so it was primarily used for military dial dials so that soldiers could easily read their watches during the nighttime hours. Yes. So you might be wondering <laughs> what radium is. And radium is a naturally occurring radioactive element. So I don't know. I, I always like to throw the little thing in there like just because it's it's radioactive, like you are exposed to a background level of radiation all the time. And radium is super common. But it is produced by the decay of uranium and thorium, and it's part of what we call the uranium series decay chain that eventually ends up 
in the various stable isotopes of lead. So it's just like one of the steps along the way to lead. And I'm sure that uh, I've talked about this before, but when an element or an isotope of a particular element is radioactive, it means that the configuration of protons and neutrons in the nucleus of the atom is unstable. You could even think of it as being too energetic And everything in nature wants to trend towards the lowest energy state, which I relate to. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So that unstable atom is going to (laughs) get to that lower energy state by, (laughs) who guessed it, releasing some energy. Uh, And we call that energy radiation. And radium is primarily extracted from the earth as a byproduct of uranium mining. And most of the world's uranium comes from mines in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Canada. So the United States Radium Corporation is one of these radium painting factories. And it was in operation from 1917 until 1926 in Orange, New Jersey. And this factory is where the story of the Radium Girls comes from. And I noticed that Megan mentions in the notes that there's also a factory in Ottawa, Illinois that opened later in 1922. I think some of the women who worked at the Illinois factory were also part of like what ultimately becomes the court case and everything. So got it. So the United States Radium Corporation and other factories like it primarily employed women because they typically had smaller hands, which was useful since the painting of the dials had to be very precise. And women at that time were actually very proud of the jobs that they had um, at these radium painting factories because they paid well. And it was a way for women to feel they were helping in the war effort. And I learned that at the time, radium was the most valuable substance on earth. Uh, It was worth $120,000 per gram, which is equal to about $2.2 million per gram in today's money. So it was like Part of it was like they felt special because it, you know, it paid well. They were getting to help out with the war effort, but also like <laughs> they were working with like, one right? Of the, yeah, like something super, super expensive, like more expensive than diamonds, more expensive than gold. So, like, there was definitely that aspect to it. Heck as yeah, well. I'd feel cool. I know. You I'd know? be like, this is, <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> look how fan, look how sweet I look. <laughs> 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 That's an inside joke about Diablo for you guys. <laughs> uh, um, so as I mentioned, the dial painting had to be very precise. So during that time, it was common practice to use their mouths to bring the tip of their paintbrush to like a very fine point. Nowadays, we know that there are health issues that arise from ingesting radium, and we will come back to those. Uh, but in the early to mid 1900s, many of the women were wor- that were working these jobs felt that that exposure was a perk of the job. Radium was first discovered in the early 1900s by Marie Curie. And after its initial discovery, Marie became very interested in radioactive, radioactive materials being used in medicine. And so she began working on the use of radium as a cancer therapy. And it was successful, um, but due to its success, it was seen as like a miracle element. Yeah, which is pretty amazing that like over 100 years ago, they recognized like, oh, you can do radiation therapy to treat cancers. Yeah, it is. So. I, I like I I don't think I knew before this that that's what she was working with was doing with it for yeah like I I thought it was just sort of like this is cool let's learn more about this I didn't realize it was like specifically for yeah. her, uh for as a cancer therapy so here's a fun fact about Marie Curie over 120 years later her lab notebooks still have to be in like a lead lined container and they're still too radioactive for people to handle. (laughs) Um, And she died from aplastic anemia brought on by radiation exposure. And like her, her husband, like they knew it was toxic. There are quotes about, you know, them getting burns on their hands and like the, the health effects that they suffered. And like people 
generally knew that like being exposed to large amounts of this was toxic. So yeah, so it's like it's this weird divide between like it being used as like medis as in medicines and stuff and like everyday products versus like, well, this will melt your fingers off. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, like they basically, just, I think is that like people just didn't, or at least the general community, or the, you know, the general population didn't understand at that time the difference between like what how it was killing cancer cells, but how it would also have a similar effect on like healthy cells. Yes. Yeah. And I'm just going to mention this now. So Paige mentioned that they saw it as like a miracle element and that uh, the women saw it as like, uh, it was a benefit to get exposed to it. And it's because it was radium was mixed into things like tonics, like there's like radioactive water, tonic water, there's toothpaste, other commercial products that people would just like use or ingest. Uh, they called it liquid sunshine. <laughs> and there was a hit song called Radium Dance from a Broadway musical at the time. So they were like all in on radium as health benefits. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I get it. I I get it that like the song yeah. was written at a different time. But it is yeah. like entirely too upbeat and happy. Yeah. And, yeah. And I hate yeah, it. I do listen to it because I, but yeah, I put the YouTube link in there and I will put it in the show notes. But it's like a ragtime, you know, dance number. Basically. <laughs> 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 it's very happy. They were super excited. Right. Like, hey, you're dying from radiation poisoning, but like, right. enjoy this jazzy dance. Like, number. this song needs to be about tacos, <laughs> not. <laughs> not radio. Yeah, although there's also that I don't know if you you or Elliot ever played like the Fallout games, but mm -hmm. I want to say it was it was one of the more recent ones. They like on the little radio or whatever in the game, it plays the song like Uranium Fever, mm. which I was like I sung that for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I still get it stuck in my head sometimes. <laughs> so they were like very very happy about radiation <laughs> at this time. <laughs> yeah. And so before we move on from Marie, it's kind of off topic, but I did think it was worth mentioning how incredible she was. Um, she was not only the first woman to win a Nobel Prize, she was also the first person to ever be awarded two, um, one in physics and one in chemistry. And she is still the only woman to have won it twice. Oh, shit. Yeah. I mean, that says more about the Nobel yeah, Prize. Yeah, I mean, that's I also... <laughs> about her. <laughs> I was gonna say. Sorry, Marie Curie. I do... I respect the hustle. I respect the that you were very smart and deserved to win it twice, but also, like, get it together, Nobel Prize. Right. But at this point, the fact that she's the only woman to have won it twice, like, that's the concerning part. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like, we should be... We should be past this. Somebody else should have won it twice by now. I'm sure the number of women who've won it is remarkably low as well. So now I made it sad. <laughs> 58 women in total have been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. How many men? Nobel Prize. 844. No! Why did I think it was going to be like, oh, it's like 80 men? And like well, and I think that number, that number has likely gone up because that – this is like – an outdated statistic because it says 48 women and it's actually been 58 so it's probably more like i would say like 875 that's my guess uh, lord well not great oh not this great. one says of all eight 972 only 58 are women so that hurts it just keeps getting worse anyway yeah. uh <laughs> 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 yeah, as you mentioned, like people were stoked about radium. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things that the women dealt with was that the radium dust that they were working with would, you know, that they were exposed to on a daily basis would make their hair and their skin and their clothes glow. And apparently, at least early on, like they were kind of excited about that. Like, that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. You come home and you're glowing. Um, yeah. And they were actually nicknamed the ghost girls, which is pretty much Ooh. the closest I could get to finding something supernatural to talk about. So I had to I had to mention it. Yes. Yeah. The fact that they were called the ghost girls. Yeah. And I actually learned 
these women would also because like they thought it was cool and fun so it's like they would also sometimes like paint their teeth and stuff so that their teeth would glow when they went home to their kids and women would go home and and or they would they would wear like fancier clothes to work so that way they could go out dancing afterwards Mm -hmm. and like have this glowing paint on them and you know it was like again they're working with the most expensive substance on earth and like they've got these prestigious jobs and so it's like they wanted to go show that off to to everybody Uh, another spooky fact that is not really paranormal, but, you know, feels <laughs> feels close, is that people claim that their bones are likely still glowing in their coffins. Because, and I, I don't know if we're going to talk too much about it, but yeah, the way that, uh, the way that radium works is it basically just like displaces the calcium in your bones. So you, it gets up, uptake, up, <laughs> up to <laughs> your up, up. What is the past? Up, took, up. Up taken? Mm, up taken? taken up. It gets seems... taken up? I think <laughs> it gets, I, I think, taken up. Yeah, I like it. It gets taken up by your bones. And yeah, then your bones end up glowing after you die from radiation poisoning. Yay. It's actually up took. It's up took? Yeah. That doesn't sound right. I that, mean, I know, I believe you. Yeah. But I up don't like it. Took. <laughs> I don't like that either. That's stupid. Taken up. I like that more. <laughs> right or wrong, that sounds better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> so uh, a lot of women didn't even question if it was safe to handle because of the understood health benefits of radium. But also I think at this time there just weren't you know, there weren't any workplace safety or employee protection standards in place. So like, I doubt it was super common for people to question their employers. Like they probably just did, went to work and did what they were supposed to do. Yeah. I mean, did we even have like child labor laws at this point? Child labor was officially ended in the 1930s. So there you go. So before child labor laws as well. So all of that being said, It does sound like there were a select few women who were questioning management and management basically told them like, oh, don't worry about it. It's fine. Yes. But it is very important to note that by this point, well, A, you've already had, you know, this is 15, 20 years after Marie Curie has been working with radium and they're aware that it's dangerous. The company, though, the U.S. Radium Corporation started extracting their own radium and men who were working in the labs at these factories doing these extractions and mixing the paints were given lead aprons and special tongs. So like they were given (laughs) some sort of PPE PPE (laughs) to protect themselves. Meanwhile, the women are still like, radium. Lick your brushes. Yeah. And like, I've, you know, I've seen some things where it's like the company or the the management was arguing like, oh, well, you guys are working with like such little amounts. And, you know, they tried to discourage them from doing the the practice of like lip pointing to make the fine points. They weren't ingesting it, but it's like, well, but then they couldn't do the job and paint their watches. So it's just a whole, it's a whole mess. And we are going to get into it right now. Unfortunately, uh, but But not surprisingly, the women do start falling ill. And some women complained of things like dizziness or just generally not feeling well. However, the most common symptom that these women were dealing with other than the glowing skin was necrosis of the jaw and loss of teeth. And I'll I'll talk a little bit about that. The first painter to deal with any like physical toll from the job was Amelia Magia. Goes, she went by Molly, um, and she had been complaining of tooth pain for some time and ended up having to get one pulled. But shortly thereafter, she then has to go and get another one pulled, and she ends up suffering from like you know jaw pain and ulcers, and she gets a bunch of infections from where the teeth were in- extracted. Uh. And it ends up spreading through her entire jaw. In fact, her lower jaw eventually has to be removed, which is just like, I mean, horrible. And unfortunately, she did pass away in September of 1922. And you can 
if you, I guess, <laughs> have the stomach for it, you can look up pictures of the, I don't know, for lack of a better word, I guess, injuries, radiation <laughs> injuries that these women ended up with. Yeah. And it is upsetting. Yeah. It's not great. Like, yeah, they're hard to look I'm, at for sure. Yeah. Like, I think it was just excruciatingly painful, I'm sure. And, and like, just just probably really scary because like she didn't know what was happening right well yeah so, i mean i can't i get like a toothache you know and it's like yeah i, I get like, a toothache and i go on webmd and webmd is like well you're probably going to be dead soon right so. <laughs> <laughs> i can only imagine you know and what? i'm like yeah okay that tracks <laughs> So I can only imagine like going to my doctor and being like, um, my face is starting to fall off. Like, should I be worried about this? Like, what is happening? Yeah. So more women in Orange, New Jersey end up getting sick and all of them with similar symptoms. And unsurprisingly, they have one thing in common, and that is that they all worked for the U.S. Radiation Corporation. Is that what it's called? Uh, It's the radium. Yeah. (laughs) That's what I thought. I was like, uh, that's not right. Uh, I don't think they want to bill themselves with the Radiation Corporation. <laughs> uh, yeah, the U.S. – sorry. They all worked for the U.S. Radium Corporation. You know, as more and more women come out, fingers start getting pointed at the factory. Um, and so the factory pays for an investigation into their processes. And apparently that report concludes that radium exposure was the cause of the women's death. However, uh, the company basically refuses to take blame. Surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise. So they pay other teams to complete, you know, different independent investigations. And those... It seems based off what I read that they basically like keep having people look at it until they get the answer they want. Obviously, that answer is like, you're not responsible. You're not doing anything wrong. Um, And so for the next several years, the general public goes on believing that like this level of radium exposure is safe. It doesn't help that at that time, the doctors were also labeling the causes of death for these women as syphilis and... I can't really say that I know enough about syphilis to really understand why that was happening. Yeah. Well, A, I feel like we are not too far removed from doctors just like declaring anything that was wrong with women like, oh, she's got hysteria or whatever. So who even knows like what they're doing? Like women's health was probably not super stellar. Right. Um, (laughs) Even by this point. Uh, I do know that syphilis can create some really weird neurological symptoms, and I think you can get like skin ulcers. So I wonder if that's why they pointed to that. But uh, heads up, all I know is that anytime you message me about feeling weird, I'm just going to tell you it might be syphilis. <laughs> Which is like once a week. So great. <laughs> once a week. I don't, could be syphilis. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> come for the spooky, stay for the syphilis. <laughs> okay, so it isn't until 1925 when a test is done by pathologist Harrison Martland that confirms without question that radium exposure was the cause of death for Molly um, and I believe some of the other women as well. Over the next couple of years, the Radium Girls hire an attorney to file a lawsuit against the U.S. Radium Corporation. And, um, I mean, obviously, you know, who wouldn't want some sort of compensation in that situation? But also, they're doing this in an attempt to help protect the women who are still working in those conditions. Mm -hmm. Uh, So go you, Radium Girls. And they end up settling out of court, and the U.S. Radium Corporation just, like, continues operating like normal um they Mm -hmm. do get most of their it sounds like most or if not all of their medical bills paid so i guess that's something but it doesn't really change much and it isn't until 1938 which is 26 years after the death of molly when a radium worker named Catherine wolf who is also dying of radio from radium exposure radiation exposure successfully sues the company and my understanding is like at this point the company has like totally, you know, changed their tune or at least like enough that they have people like 
in in respiratory protection and stuff. So like, mm. it's too late in that like people are already they've yeah. already like made changes and like people have already died. So so since the dial painting factories were first established, we've obviously learned a lot about radium and. I mean, just radioactive materials in general. But we do now know that chronic exposure to radium causes a slightly increased risk to different cancers, particularly bone and lung cancer. And higher doses of radium exposure for long periods can cause anemia. They can cause it can cause cataracts, which hmm. I didn't written I didn't know that. I thought that was odd. Um, yeah, interesting. A tooth loss, and then, like Megan talked about earlier, it will actually begin attacking your bones. Yes. And worth noting that radium, so it's part of this decay chain on the way from uranium down to lead, and there are lots of steps in between. But radium itself decays to another radioactive element, radon, which I think most people are familiar uh, these days. But that is gaseous and Many houses, including mine, I don't know if yours does, have radon mitigation systems to safely vent the gas outside of the home. So like once finished basements and stuff became a more popular thing, it's just like it's naturally released from bedrock or like it can be um, you can have the it like in bubbles in your water coming out into your home. But both radium and radium, ra- bleh, both Radon. <laughs> this has been me with radium and radiation the whole time. I keep saying I'm wrong. Both, <laughs> too many R words. Both radium and radon are used today medicinally to treat several forms of cancer. So it's still used for like its original intention. So I found this presentation uh, titled How the Radium Girls Changed Industrial Safety. And admittedly, I didn't put like a ton of information on here from that, but I did. It will be linked in our show notes if you're interested. I may be the only one. (laughs) I really wish we could get like tracking on the clicks for that. (laughs) One other person. Zero people have clicked on it. Um, (laughs) But it is really cool because like we talked about, like at this time, there like there wasn't any standard for workplace safety like at all. Um, And I mean, like we were still, you know, sending kiddos in for work. So this is really... Uh, one of the first cases where a company is held responsible for the deteriorating deteriorating health of their employees, which mm-hmm. is big. I mean, that's really big. <laughs> yeah. To what you were saying about the company being held responsible, obviously getting into the weeds and the details of the court case would require like an entire season of a serialized podcast. Yeah. And if you are interested, the Radium Girls book is excellent so go watch that or go watch that go read that you read it (laughs) yeah oh (laughs) for this not for this i had read it before oh i didn't know that what the hell megan i don't know i have a copy of it if you want to borrow (laughs) yeah for sure (laughs) (laughs) it's really good it's like really good but like just just in short these women fought so hard some of them were testifying from their deathbeds because the company was like trying to drag things out as long as possible and like i heard it put like the company was basically just trying to like wait them out and yeah they were like died waiting for them to die (laughs) right before they could you know actually go to court and like go through this go through this whole legal process yeah and shockingly, or maybe not shockingly, we don't know, the Ottawa, Illinois factory wasn't shut down officially until 1978. Wow. And they've gone back in, inspectors have gone back in and measured radiation levels. And they are 1,666 times over what is considered a safe or like background level of radiation exposure. Jesus. And that's just like on the property. <laughs> so <laughs> with like all the, the radioactive stuff removed at this point. So yeah. Or with the primary source removed, I guess. Fuck those guys. Am I right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the radium girls case and 
ones like it end up laying the groundwork for organizations like OSHA. Woo woo. And (laughs) pages BFFs. (laughs) Which was not officially formed until the 1970s. So like the 1978 date isn't all that surprising to me. Cause like gotcha. You know, who would who would force that shutdown if not if not them? Obviously this this story is was interesting to us for a lot of reasons, but big exciting for me because without everything that the radium girls went through i mean osha would have come about eventually i imagine Mm -hmm. but like it's hard to say how long it would have been before that happened so now it is time for safety page psa (laughs) Uh, um (laughs) because we're talking about it and we may never talk about it again so here it goes except we're gonna do lab disasters part two okay (laughs) yes i'll find another thing to say that time (laughs) uh yeah do not hesitate ever to speak out if you're feeling your workplace is not doing their part in protecting you from the hazards because these women did not have the organizations or laws in place to help protect them from radium exposure but like they like Megan said fought super hard to really be able to give us all the opportunity to be protected and bring up concerns at work. And I read that this had like pretty far reaching implications, like even before OSHA ends up getting established, like people said, I read in a couple places that like the safety regulations that surrounded all the radioactive materials they were working with for the Manhattan Project in the 40s, like, Mm -hmm. would not have nearly been as strict as they ended up being if it hadn't been for what had happened to the radium girls and, like, what they learned from their experience and, like, the exposure that they had and, like, the safety precautions that they needed to take. So, yeah. That's my thing. Just don't ever hesitate to speak out. There are things in place to protect you if you ever feel you need to make that decision. So that's- and if you're like me and you don't like confrontation, you can call Paige and she'll do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll help protect you. That's a hotline service that we offer now. <laughs> <laughs> Just email us at spooky science sisters at gmail.com. Join our Patreon and Paige will. <laughs> <laughs> Deliver a verbal beatdown about safety to your employer. <laughs> we don't have a Patreon. <laughs> yeah, so don't do that. <laughs> but should we start one to offer this service? <laughs> All righty. Well, <laughs> you have anything else to add? I don't think so. Well, that wraps up our episode on the Radium Girls. Tune in for episode 46 on the Enfield Poltergeist. Woohoo! Yeah, it's a it's a listener request, so we're really excited about it. If you liked this episode, hit subscribe and share with a friend. You can find us on TikTok at Spooky Science, Twitter and Instagram at Spooky SciPod, Facebook at Spooky Science Sisters, and at our website, SpookySciencesisters.com. If you have any questions about previous topics or ideas for future episodes, email us at SpookySciencesisters at gmail.com. As always, thank you for listening and stay spooky. Spooky Science Sisters is a proud member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. For more information or to check out other shows, please visit evergreenpodcasts.com.